Welcome back, everybody, to the Knuckleball Experience Show. Uh, today, our guest is going to be Eddie Gamboa. Uh, Eddie has a uh, wealth of experience, a bunch of years thrown professionally, um, overseas, winter leagues, uh, pitched in the big leagues for the Tampa Bay Rays. Uh, Eddie and I met a couple years ago, but we'll get into that. Um, so uh, welcome to the show, Eddie. Thank you, Zach. Thank you so much for having me here. I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to to talk about the knuckleball. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. So, um, yeah, Eddie, why don't you just walk us through maybe your uh, your baseball background, maybe where you started, you know, when you started playing baseball, and um, you know, you know, like high school ball and college ball. Yeah, so I went to uh, Merced High School in the Central Valley. Um, and I was fortunate to have great coaches around me, Lou Souza, uh, Coach Petiti, Coach Witten, um, who really kind of made me into the player I am, I was then, I guess I should say. Um, obviously, you know, the the typical, your first coach is your dad, and, you know, he's trying to teach you everything possible about the game. But uh, having them to kind of pick their brain, um, and even our uh, our junior college coach, Coach Pedretti, who uh, I didn't go to junior college, but I was his son's age, Joel Pedretti. And um, and so we were fortunate to kind of have him as a coach during our travel ball team. So very, very cool experience as a young kid. And, um, you know, was grinding, you know, nothing, nothing that wowed you out of high school. I was probably a buck 60 out of uh, with a wet t-shirt on at (laughs) my senior year, throwing mid eighties. Yeah. Um, but I was competitive, you know, I was very competitive and I was fortunate that UC Davis, um, the Aggies gave me an opportunity. They gave me a partial scholarship to go out, out there and play. Um, and I just never looked back, you know, but I started throwing the knuckleball when I was 13. You know, mm-hmm. I think dad was watching uh Candiotti pitch with the Dodgers with it and just making batters look silly. Um, and he kind of said, Hey, grab your glove. Like, let's, we're, let's go to the backyard and you're going to, you know, so he had no idea how he gripped, you know, I think I was throwing it with like all four fingers at the time and just, you know, literally pushing it like a shock put, mm-hmm. um, you know, just trying to, trying to kill the spin, you know, which I was, I didn't know what I was doing, mm-hmm. but I just remember getting mad at my father about like, why are we throwing this knuckleball when, you know, at the time <laughs> I was throwing cheese. Yeah. So, uh, you know, little did I know that it was going to get me to a childhood dream of getting to the big league. So, very cool um you know but it wasn't the route I expected to take if that makes any sense yeah usually yeah usually it's not it's like a like a last resort for most guys it's like you know you mess around with like most position players or most guys on the sideline so um okay so that was your first experience um so like all right, so you you went to what UC Davis and you, would, you got drafted what your senior year? Yeah, so I went to UC Davis. Um, UC Davis was a Division two when I when I decided to go there, but we were the first class um, to go D one. Okay, and so they were kind of uh, trying to get together the team, you know, to really be competitive. And we're in the Big West, so uh, Long Beach, Fullerton. Uh, you know, all these big schools, UC Irvine was huge out here too. So um, we were going to be in that division with them. And so um, it, was, it was tough. It was really yeah. tough, but they prepared us enough for it. And so as soon as we were eligible to go do one, we hit the ground running mm-hmm. and um, we, we made, um, we made regionals, I think that year mm-hmm. or semi-regionals, or I don't even know what they call it now, but uh, we had a really good team. Um, our first year being eligible as a D1, as a D1 program. So um, again, a lot of great coaches that were involved in that, but I didn't throw the knuckleball then. Um, You know, I was, I was a normal, you know, 88, 92 guy in college Mm -hmm. uh, with a little slider, good change up, went down with Tommy John. So had some downfalls there, but um, when I was able to come back, as a fifth year senior, okay. um, I was able to do well enough to, uh, to get drafted, you know, and, um, and in my mind, I feel like I never thought of what if I don't get drafted? I think that's so yeah. crazy. 
that now looking back, right? Because yeah. the odds are against us. But I never had that doubt. I just mm-hmm. I always knew that I was going to play professional. I knew that um, I was going to keep playing. You know, mm-hmm. I don't think I don't think people are are ready to you know hang up their cleats right mm-hmm. after college or right after high school for that matter. What which happens a lot to a lot mm-hmm. of players. So um, I just kept the dream alive, you yeah. know, literally, yeah. and and just grinding it out. And so, again, it's just things worked out. I was a Friday guy my senior year. Um, I got a lot of great opportunities. We had um, some great players come out of Daniel Descalso, who was with the Cardinals for a very long time. Uh, Jake Jeffries was a, for a third-round pick. He was my catcher. So we had scouts at the field. I was pitching against their Friday night guys. Mm-hmm. Um, so so the looks were there, and I, that's that's all I feel like I needed was just the opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, and so yeah, we went with it, and was fortunate to be with the Orioles for you know I think it was like seven eight years. Mm-hmm. So I started and ended my career in the states with the Orioles. Heck yeah, nice. All right. Um, can you, can you talk, talk to us a little bit about when you, like you said, you, you didn't really throw in, in college and high school. Can you talk about, um, and I, you know, I, I, I got a little insight here, but can you tell the audience about when you first started throwing it competitively and, and what inspired you and, um, you know, what made you do that? Start throwing the knuckleball competitively. Yeah. So I, I always threw it as a joke. Yeah. And catch with our friends, yeah. you know, trying to make them look silly, hitting them in the chest, yeah. um, whiffing at it. Um, and I remember when at Merced High, where the Bears, my junior year, we won section championship. We won the section championship. Yeah. And my last pitch that I threw was a knuckleball. Oh, heck yeah. Um, and so it was pretty cool kind of, you know, to with the bang, finish up. Um, my high school coach, Lou Souza, he was a lefty and he threw a knuckleball. He threw a really good knuckleball. Um, and I, you know, I guess we were winning like seven, three, seven, four. So we had right. some cushion in there, had the guy two strikes, two outs. I was like, you know, let, let's throw Why this not? thing. And so my catcher, Josh Rossin called it and, you know, we got a whiff and we won it. But that was one of the very few times I threw a knuckleball competitively, um, until I met you. Um, you know, and that's when, you know, you came in in 2013 with the Orioles. Um, I was one of those guys, I was getting older. I think I was 27 at the time. So being in double A, triple A, you know, you're, you're kind of, you're a veteran, you're old, yeah. you're on the way out. Um, yeah. you know, this, this game, it's, it's a little kid game. So yeah. it's, it's coming, it's getting younger and younger every year. Um, and, but I was doing well enough to to hold on to a job you know I didn't I wasn't the guy through 95 but I was you know 88 91 I would touch a two and my ERA was always under a three you know Mm -hmm. and my walks were limited so I feel like we were I was just stuck you know I was doing well enough to keep a job but I wasn't doing well enough to move up you know triple a was for the the minor league uh or the minor league players with big league experience yep. those guys went to triple a and so we were just kind of held up in double a for a while so um when we met you know and i think you remember like i was your catch partner i, I had heard that he threw the knuckleball and so yeah i made it a point that oh i want to play catch with zach you know let's 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 throw this thing and so we threw some back and forth um and again i hadn't done that ever really you know again yeah. we would just throw it jokingly but having a catch play for, you know, 20, 30 pitches, um, probably more like 50, 60 with us, right? Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, one more. When you one told more. me <laughs> – one more, yeah. Uh, when you told me that uh, Phil Necro was going to go out there and, and see you, you know, you remember my reaction. I was like, hey, like, can I come? Can I yeah. Can I join in? I, I want to yeah. meet this guy, you know? Yeah. Um, he was before our time, but – being a hall of famer i mean it's not every day you get to meet somebody with um with that resume like yeah. his so um and that was that you know yeah i i think you remember i i sat in sat in i watched your your bullpen with him and 
the things that he talked about. And then he, you know, when you were done, we we're, you know, getting ready to take it in. And he's like, hey, Eddie, are you going to throw any? I'm yeah. like, no, no. Like, no, yeah. you're, you know, this guy's going to laugh at me, right? And uh, but I was like, all right, you know, we'll throw a couple. And um, mm-hmm. and so fortunately, he had a, a great relationship with Dan Duquette, who I believe is who took him in to work with you. Um, and, and Dan Duquette really just gave both of us, uh, well, for you, he gave you a life in pro ball. For me, he gave yeah. me a second life. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, and, and I think we were very fortunate that they were patient. Um, they were investing in with taking in, you know, Phil Negro and, and really stayed patient with us because it's not easy mm-hmm. and it's never been easy. Yeah. Um, but, but you were the inspiration to go along with it and try it out. Yeah. So really, really cool. Really cool. How we were able to link up with the, with the Orioles and, and start throwing it together. Well, you already threw it, but we were kind of picking each other's brains. Yeah, yeah man. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah, it's awesome. It's not every day you have that opportunity. And um, yeah, like I'm super grateful, you know, like, like you said, Dan Duquette, I mean, that guy, uh, I owe him a lot. And, um, you know, obviously with Phil, like opportunities, um, huge. And yeah, it's great to pass it on. You know what I mean? Like, there's not a lot of guys. They're just like, ah, whatever. I'm not throwing it. Um, but Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy, yeah. Zach. I mean, I, I, it's very rare for somebody or something to make me lose sleep, you know, but the knuckleball got me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that knuckleball was that, that crazy ex-girlfriend that just man is just making me pull my hair out but um oh yeah you know with um with all that just going on yeah i mean it we were just very fortunate you know yeah uh, dan Juke was open to the idea uh buck show walter he you know at the time he was the manager for the orioles and and he was the one who kind of pushed r.a dickey to turn into a knuckleballer i think they were with the rangers Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's one of those things where everything kind of had a lineup for us to really jump into it and 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 give it a shot. Yeah. But um, but yeah, no, it wasn't it wasn't easy, you know, mm-hmm. it definitely wasn't. Um, and I think mainly for me because I was a normal pitcher, so my game was command or control, I should say. You know, I was always gonna be around the zone. Um, if I was going to give up seven hits a game, I was going to give them up, but they weren't, I wasn't going to lose a game walking the bases. And so as a pitching coach, you love guys like that, that go out there and compete and they give you their all. So when it came to trying out to be a knuckleballer, you know, oh man, ball four, ball four. Oh, you know, but, and Phil Neeker would say, you're the only guy that could go out there and you could walk the bases loaded and then strike the next three guys out, you know? And it's like, well, yeah, you know, it's true. But yeah. when you're so accustomed to just being around the zone and, and controlling the run game, um, and then all of a sudden you're throwing a knuckleball with a runner on first and you got a slight step and it's like, oh, you know? So, um, again, just experiences that I never thought I would be a part of, but it, it, it was something that happened. It was great. Mm-hmm. But at the time, it was it was stressful. Oh, we're yeah. all, we're on an island by ourselves. It felt like. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was different for me. Like this was my this is my line. Like this is my lifeline, my foot in. Like this is all I'm in. You know, it was, you know, for you, it was like you were already there. You were throwing really well, right? You probably could have. Yeah, I felt like I yeah I felt yeah. like I was doing well. Yeah. Um, that year, I'm trying to think of. Uh, so that was 2013 um 2014 i got a big league invite yeah right and so i finished strong in 2013 um and no actually no i take that back i did well in double a um and when i was in double a you know because again they i mean we were halfway done with spring training when i started throwing the knuckleball right so they said all right you're gonna go back to double a you're gonna throw it and i said well am I allowed to go 50 50 with it? And they said, yeah, just, but we want you to throw it and, you know, just kind of play around with it. Yeah. So I I think it was like around June, May, June, where 
I started kind of grooving along with it. I was using it like a pitcher now would use a split finger, mm-hmm. right? O two, one two count, like here it is. Yeah. And I was able to string together a couple of great outings. I think I went uh no hitter followed by a one hitter followed by like a you know um a quality outing. So I was able to put something together where, oh man, okay. But I was 50 50, you know, yeah. again, throwing it like somebody would throw a split finger. Um, so I get the promotion to AAA and I'm surrounded by veterans, right? Yeah. Guys with big league time. Um, uh, Griffin, he was, he's been a, he was a AAA coach for the longest time. And I get there and I'm about to pitch. I'm like, yeah, all right. And they said, all right, so. Uh, you know, just one is a knuckleball, right? I said, uh, well, no, you know, <laughs> one is fastball, yeah. you know, because I, I want to use all my pitches, not yeah. just the knuckle. And so this was, and I forget his name, God, I wish I could think, but he was a veteran catcher. And he's like, well, there's knuckleballers don't do that. You're a knuckleballer. And, uh, and so my first outing in AAA, right? I got to throw all knuckleballs. Oh, it's like, gosh. oh man, like, I don't know where these things are going. Like, and so I'm throwing knuckleballs 2-0, 2-1, 3-1 in situations where I wasn't really – I would never really throw a knuckleball, right? But it was true. If you're a knuckleball pitcher, um, you're got to throw it in any count. Yeah. And so I struggled with that. And I did terrible in AAA. And so that was the first year in 2013 when that season ended, uh, I went to winter ball. Yeah. And so when I got to winter ball in Mexico, I was with the miles of Navajo and I went back to my 50, 50 yeah. and killed it, you yeah. know? And so I was really just stuck. I'm like, yeah. am I a knuckleball pitcher or am I a pitcher that throws a knuckleball? Um, and so I think I played, I had a God, my whole knuckleball career was pretty much that, you mm-hmm. know, am I this or am I that? Like, you know, why am I throwing this? If, you know, there was a couple of guys that, I threw a little harder than, you know, yeah. like, you now again, I was 90, 92 guy at the, yeah. at the highest, but I had some sink. I had to cut like, so I had a hard time of being like, well, why am I not throwing the fastball if I could still get outs with it? Yeah. So um, that was probably my weakness in terms of like, not thinking of the future, you know, Buck Walter was thinking of the future for me. Uh, you know, yeah, you could have a couple bad years with your knuckleball, but once you master it, like what R.A. Dickey was able to do, yeah, like you're going to have a long career, uh, not just in the minor leagues, but in the yeah. big leagues. Yeah. So um, I see what where he was coming from. Um, but at the time, I saw where I was coming from. Why did it's like, well, I, I could still bring it up there. You know, I was still throwing 93 in spring training. I remember that was 2013 or 14 where – I had a, my, I was feeling good. Yeah. Um, but you know, the knuckleball was, was something that was just really hard to, to master, I should say. Oh yeah. I don't think you ever mastered. Yeah. You never mastered. No, no, you're right. I I mean, I asked Phil, he's like, Oh, I never mastered it. I was still figuring it out last year Mm -hmm. of my career. Like it's like a, it's like a, you know, the energizer Bonnie, you're always chasing it. You never, you never have hold of it. It's just, you, you, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, just like regular pitching, but yeah, you're always chasing it. You can never sit down, yeah. put your feet up. It's like, ooh. All right. So can you talk a little bit about your grip and how you how you first started gripping the ball and uh, how you maybe, um, you know, any adjustments? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, so when I was 13, right, when yeah. when Ken Diari was on TV and my dad said, hey, um, you know, I held it. Oh, God like that okay i mean nothing even close shock putting it um you know it was whatever it was but it was like the the almost like the tricycle wheels of of throwing a knuckleball right yeah yeah. like really just you know learning it having a feel for it yeah um and then um we had in merced we had uh one of my good friends gus sanchez who's two years older than me Mm-hmm. And he was a shortstop. He was like always ahead of me. And so he was yeah. like my role model coming up 
mm-hmm. and who I wanted to be like because I mean he was just a stud. Yeah. Um, and he threw a knuckleball. Mm-hmm. So and he held it the traditional way. Okay. You know, right here or on the top of the horseshoe. Mm-hmm. Um, he might have been oh God, he might have gotten four seam actually, because we just didn't know any better. Um but he was somebody that I got to throw it with and slowly start learning, you know, with the two fingers and throwing it, right? Mm-hmm. So that was the way I kind of, when you and I started, I think I was on the bottom of the horseshoe mm-hmm. only because I didn't want my fingers touching those laces. Yep. And so when I would go on the top, for some reason, this bad boy would click right here yeah. on the seam and it just didn't feel right for me so yeah i would always go on the bottom of the horseshoe here and then i wouldn't feel that seam touch anything at all okay um at some point i would use the seam yeah um you know because again we're i was trying everything right so but obviously when you when you're holding on to the seam seam is what creates spin yep um you know, that's why you hold your slider on the seam and your yep. purple on the seam and your fastball, you're, you know, getting that back spin. So with the knuckleball, the goal was to not have any seams on it. And so, um, and Ari and Dickie really explained that very well for me mm-hmm. um, in talking about his grip and, and what he thought about. And he was literally just going this way. You mm-hmm. know, he wanted to be almost like an iron mic, right? Yeah. Going up and almost like hit himself in the jock. So, yeah. Um, and again, he God, man, it was so cool to watch him throw that thing, and and you know, and Stephen Wright for that matter yeah. too. Stephen Wright was somebody that I got to play with in the minor leagues, so uh, he was an open book, you know. And and I was very fortunate to have you, Ra, and Stephen Wright because I would text Stephen Wright, and I mean, he would answer back like that. Um, hmm. And he was in the big leagues, yeah. knowing. I mean, this was when he was in the prime and everything, so. Um, very great to have them, uh, in my corner and you obviously, but, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it was just really plain with it, man. It's just that spin, the, the, you know, is it back spinning? Is it going forward? What's it doing? Um, and just trying to master it down. But I do remember Phil, I think always telling us about holding it on the top of the horseshoe, because if you threw a perfect knuckleball, you had the seams on top and it would work its way down. So you would mm. throw it to the triangle, top of the triangle, and then it was yeah. always going to work its way down as opposed to going this way, where which I liked. Yeah. But if we threw that perfect knuckleball, we didn't have no seams on the top. Mm. Therefore, it could possibly rise or it just really take mm. off on you. So I remember that analogy. And uh, and I tried my best again. You know, we we, we tried different grips. Yeah. Um, I think Stephen Stephen Wright he would cut this one in half that that seam and he would just hold it in there. You know, so everyone had something different. Oh yeah. But um, but yeah, I mean, it was it was uh, for the time being, it was it was great to to really try and master it or or get better at it day by day. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you know, and you know, as good as I do, I probably had about 20,000 throws into a wall a year, mm. um, you know, and just throwing it, throwing it, throwing it. And, you know, just trying to find something that would click. Yeah. Right. That's, I think that's what we're looking for is that click feeling. Um, and that could change week to week, month to month, yeah. day by day. Like, Oh, it was, it was crazy. It was super yeah. crazy. So, um, there's, you know, I got my questions here and, you know, you hit on some of them already, but um, how did your approach to pitching with a knuckleball mature from, like you said, like maybe 2013 to, to today? Like, um, for instance, you know, maybe your approach was uh, I'm going to make this thing dance a lot or, you know, hey, I'm going to just let him hit it or, you know, like your approach, your mentality with the with the pitch throwing it. Uh, what changed, I think as you mature with it, you know, I think early on when you were, the goal was to try to get all the swing and misses as possible and, yeah. and make somebody look silly. Yeah. Um, and really like prove to everybody like, Oh man, okay, this guy, this guy could throw it. Yeah. Uh, later on in the career, it's more of like, okay, you just got to throw it. You just want to pitch the contact, yep. you know? Um, the hitter doesn't know when you're going to throw a bad knuckleball. Mm-hmm. so you got to lose that fear of like what if it spins what if you know it's just a 
it's a because if it starts spinning, especially with backspin, it's a seventy-four mile an hour fastball right down the middle. Yeah, you know. Um, but with time, you learn to realize like the hitters, they don't want to hit a knuckleball. They don't want to yeah. face a knuckleball pitcher. Yeah. Um, and they don't know when you're gonna make a mistake with spitting a knuckleball. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? So sometimes we're we would give these hitters more credit than what they deserved. Mm-hmm. Um and they're great hitters, obviously, right? Double A, triple A, uh, big leagues, like these are great hitters. So but mentally you had to kind of get yourself like, hey, like nobody wants to hit an uncle ball. Like they're yeah. up there, they don't want to swing, they don't want to see all these pitches. And and you just got to kind of use that to your advantage of just throwing it down the middle, let it wiggle a little bit. You know, it's a game of inches, so yep. they miss it by a centimeter, and it's a pop up to the center fielder, and it stays in the in the ballpark. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think with time, that's that's one of the things that I got to learn with experience with it. Of like, just throw it, just throw it down the middle, the top of the triangle. Don't try to hit any corners. Don't try to make anybody look silly, mm-hmm. um, and just throw it. You know, mm-hmm. and so that was a big thing that that I was able to learn with it, um, and I'm still trying to learn with it. But like my mentality now is pitch to contact, and not so much pitch to swing and misses. Yeah, I'm right with you, man. I mean, you, for me, if you're trying to throw this big nasty stuff, it's harder to throw it for strikes. Just let them hit it. Um, right, right. I think my my nastiest knuckleballs I threw were ball fours. Yeah. yeah? Yeah, well, that's so cute. Tell you, what? Yeah. yeah, that's cute. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Not <laughs> so is your time. RA when it spikes up. Yeah, exactly. It's like, no. <laughs> Not good. All right. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, how you maybe uh, upset it, how you upset uh, hitters' timing when, when you're using the knuckleball? Like, did you change speeds with it? Um, did you add a little bit at certain times? What uh? What were the signs? Like, oh man, this would be a good time to throw a hard one or a soft one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my so a knuckleball could be three different pitches in one, right? You have uh your your hard one that I could get 80, 82 miles an hour. Oh, wow. You have your medium one that was mid seventies, mm-hmm. and then you have your slow one that's anything below seventy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I say anything below seventy because it could have been sixty seven, sixty eight. Yeah. It could have been fifty. Right. The ones where you really, you know, I remember Phil Negro loved that one. He would, he always talked about when he would like throw and it would like come out of the TV and then yeah. just come back in. And so uh, and I remember R8 doing that a couple of times, too. And so I think my slowest knuckleball was probably 50, 51. I don't know if I got anything below, but it was literally just floated up there. Right. So uh, three different knuckleballs, you're. You're slow, slow, or slowest, I should say, yeah. because we don't we don't really throw very hard when it comes to a knuckleball. So yeah, slow, slower, slowest, yeah, and just changing up those speeds. Yep. You know, um, at the time, I think when I was learning it, we um, we had um, Rick Peterson. I think it was our pitching coordinator. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so he was all about messing with people with the hitters timing so the whole thing with like Nestor Cortez what he's doing now or like the quick pitch yep that was kind of becoming a thing and so I would quick pitch with the knuckleball I would sidestep you know with nobody on obviously right like you yeah. just kind of just go with the flow of it but um but yeah that was that was pretty much it I got a slow one a slower one and the slowest one and you know for the hitter to kind of know which one it's going to be you know these hitters are so used to being hitting the median of uh, 88 to 95 mile an hour fastball. Like their, their timing is on that. So uh, anything above it or below it is already throwing them off. Right. And so, and again, that might've been another thing that it took me a while to learn because I was like, well, no, like my fastball's, you know, 91, my fastball's 90. Well, yeah, but that's like right in the heart of what they're used to, you know? I could throw my fastball 83 miles an hour and I could make them look silly that way instead of throwing it harder, but not so much folding them. Yep. So it was a lot of trial and error. Um, and, and again, I mean, it was just, it was just learning and trying to feel it out, trying to feel out mm-hmm. these hitters. Um, my favorite hitters to face were the power hitters because they were just swinging. They were going mm-hmm. for it. You know, they're, 
you're trying to hit a ball 500 feet. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the hardest ones were like those leadoff guys, those slappers, those slap runner, running gun guys, bunner runners, we call them, right? Um, yeah. Those guys were tough because they would see pitches fall in. They didn't, they, they didn't mind hitting with two strikes um, and they would just foul and foul and foul. And so those were the tough outs with the knuckleball for me. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And usually got the tight strike zone too. Yeah. You know, the smaller guys. All right. So um, can you talk to us a little bit about your preseason and in-season throwing? Like, were you long tossing your knuckleball? Were you trying to throw off the mound a lot? Um, like you, you mentioned earlier about throwing against the wall, right? I mean, um, mm-hmm. what 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 did that look like? How did you prepare for the season? And how did you stay ready during the season? I think it was normal. For me, yeah. I think I, I stayed normal. I, I hit the weights. I ran, mm-hmm. um, you know, because your arm's got to be ready for it. So, I'd get my long toss in. Mm-hmm. I had a good little throwing program that the organization would kind of send out, and then you kind of make it into your own throwing program. But, yeah. um, you know, and I think because I was – at the time, I was still a pitcher with a knuckleball. I would just use it like anybody would throw a split finger, right? So, my first two bullpens probably would have been just all fastballs. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe the third one would have been just all knuckleball. Mm-hmm. And then slowly start throwing everything in there. But um, you know, you just never you never stop throwing it, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think I think that's something that that says a lot about us because we yeah. we you know during, even during the off season it was still on our mind. Oh yeah, you know. Um, and I don't think people give Stephen Wright, Ari Dickey, Wakefield, for that matter, of like, man, they're gonna go out there, they're gonna throw five, six, seven innings, mm-hmm. and what if what if they don't have it? Yeah. What if you know, yeah. they get that little wind against against their face, and yeah. nothing's gonna be dancing. Yeah. But what if you don't know where it's headed? Yep. Um. So so for them to have the careers that they did with the knuckleball, um. God, man, my hats off to them because it's not easy. It wasn't easy. They made it look easy, mm-hmm. but it wasn't easy. Yeah, and the strike zone over the years has gotten tighter. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's so like, right now. Especially with yeah. the uh, the computers, robots, all that stuff, like throwing for a strike, because yeah, not easy. No, no. Right now, <laughs> that zone is super tight. Yeah. And um, you know, Wakefield, Wakefield was one of the first ones. Uh, zone was a little big. Yeah. You know, and he dropped down. He wasn't I mean, your very conventional pitcher because he was our first baseman. But obviously, the career that he had was unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Um. R.A. Dickey was, I think, one of the first ones that made it look more like an iron mic of really over the top and throwing it. You know, he was one of the the first ones, to me, that was throwing it 80 miles an hour um, and really just getting it in there. Mm -hmm. You know, same with Stephen Wright. Stephen Wright Mm -hmm. mastered his his mechanics. And so I was trying to follow them, Yeah, you know, uh, into really throwing it, Mm -hmm. it, getting it 80 miles an hour, I think. The, obviously the closest point from point A to point B is in a straight line. And so if yeah. I could just throw the knuckleball, it would be somewhere around the zone. You know, I think that was the what what we had to accomplish in that first inning as starting pitchers with the knuckleball. Is is all right, is he controlled with the knuckleball? And so, yeah. you know, when you go through the lineup that second time, it's like, okay, he's around the zone. We got to swing at these first pitches. Yeah, it's almost like the harder you throw it, the less time it has to deviate from the straight line. So you can start, you know, at the catcher's face mask at 65, but it's so slow it has extra time to move, and then it's driving you crazy. Versus if mm-hmm. you throw it harder, it's got less time to deviate. Less less movement, yeah. but it's still got that wiggle, right? It's still yep. got the wiggle. you got to trust that, you know, it's going to – Gravity is going to do its thing. And and again, the hitter doesn't know when you're going to throw a bad one. Yep. So, um, yeah, you just got to throw it. Gotcha. Um, and you kind of you kind of hit on it uh, with mechanics. You talked about the whole iron mic thing, right? You want to – your approach, it sounds to me, is you were – you might have not have done it, but you were thinking about your arm path going, uh, you know, what, 12 to really 6. Really coming – yeah, really trying to go 12 to 6. So, when – 
when I started throwing it, I already had arm issues, unfortunately. I had some bone spurs that were kind of picking at me at my elbow. And so I really had a hard time of extending forward like everybody would uh, would tell me to do. Yeah. Um, you know, and so I was in that double-A, triple-A um, level where we were already going over, you know, videos and really breaking us down and what we could work on. And, and oh, God, in a lot of my videos, I was coming across my body, almost supinating across my body because yeah. I could not get that feeling of finishing forward. So I had to throw at some time, at, at a point, I was almost thinking curveball, like a chop, where my I would catch at the right time and have it come out for it to go, you know, forward. Um, but it wasn't the way to do it, clearly, when, you know, my elbow just got worse and worse with that. You know, imagine going out there and throwing 90 curveballs. Yeah. That's pretty much what I was doing when I was throwing the knuckleball. And so when, uh, when I was able to get my bone spurs taken out, I started throwing the knuckleball again. And now I'm thinking almost like a circle change. I don't know if you could see how yeah. it, it becomes. It's not like a circle circle, but in my head, if I'm thinking circle change, I'm going to stay behind it and pronate through it and stay through it. Um, and that to me was what pretty much helped me. But I had a really hard time having that grip and just going forward. My finger somehow, it wanted me to turn over or I could, I had a hard time staying inside of it, you know? And so, um, yeah, again, lost, lost a lot of sleep with it because it's like, man, how can I just make it feel like a change of grip or like, yeah. a, you know, two seam grip, like where I could stay behind it and just go forward. Um, the grip wouldn't allow me to feel like I was behind it. I always felt like I was already going more in a supination. Yep. And that's where this came in like a curveball. So trying to stay inside of it and behind it um, was tough. I feel better about it now yeah. than I ever did, but it was tough on the brain and, and, you know, again, trying to repeat it over and over again was just killer. Yeah. Nice. Uh, what about, I mean, like mechanics from, you know, when did you make any adjustments from before you started throwing the knuckleball to when you started throwing it a good bit, like 50, 50, did you change your stride length? Uh, I mean, I know you talked about your arm. Was there any other adjustments you had to make? Yeah, I did. I dropped down a couple of times too. I remember okay. thinking about having these two fingers be the foundation of the ball this way. And I would yeah. drop down and. And so I could throw it harder. Yeah. But again, I was coming across my body. So my misses were side to side yep. and not so much up down. Um, and that's going to be a big thing that knuckleballers, uh, the issue that they're going to, you know, encounter in games, right? Yeah. You could have a great knuckleball and you could throw the crap out of it. But yeah. if you're missing side to side, you're no longer looking at, oh, okay, ball four, like you're hitting batters. Yep. And so, you know, if you hit two, three of them in a row, you better believe there's somebody warming up in that bullpen. Yeah. Yeah, and you have more room for error this way, right? Strike zone's yeah, taller exactly. this way. And it's harder, that to, way. it's harder to adjust. It's harder for a hitter to adjust to this versus this, right? If you just look at a bat, you got more room, sweet spot this way than you do this way. So if you can get that late bite, whatever you want to call it, drop, depth, whatever, I feel yeah. like that's harder to adjust to versus side to side, righty to righty, they can slap that slotting knuckleball. Yeah, absolutely. So right. that's, you know, I think that's how we learned it, right? Throw it at the top of the triangle. Yeah. Um, it's going to be very rare for a ball to kind of take off rising, which but people I'm sure did tell us, like, did that ball go up? But it's very rare for it. It's going to work its way either this way or that way, but it's going to work its way down. So um, throwing it at the top of the triangle. Everybody was trying to hit their fastball, throw them knee high and, mm -hmm. you know, and then you and I, we were the opposite. We we're trying to miss up. Yep. Um, so, so again, very comp complete opposite of uh, opposite approach when it comes to being a pitcher. Mm -hmm. But it's like, wait, so I got to throw it high? Like, you know, yeah. so um, some cool, just, you know, some cool experiences with it where you're just sitting like, oh, man, like, do you want me to miss up this? Yeah. You know? Um. They want me to throw an 83 mile on fastball, you know, like that. Yeah. That's every high school kid's dream to hear. Hey, we want you in the big leagues and throw an 83, 84. 
So, uh, <laughs> yeah, but uh, easier easier said than done. Gotcha. Um, let's see here. Going over a lot. I don't know. One problem I I had. I don't know about you, right? The pitch is a field pitch. So, you know, you're pitching in GCL, it's 95 with humidity. You know, with sweat, you know what I mean? Like, you know what I mean? Like, was sweat a big deal? Like, what, uh, we're keeping the feel of the pitch? Or that didn't really bother um, you? Yeah, yeah, I know. The sweat would definitely be an issue. I, I had, a, I cut my nails. Yeah. I would cut my nails before every outing. Okay. Um, it would help me have a feel. I didn't cut my nails today, but yeah, I it would help me really feel like I was a part of the ball. And so yeah, um, I know that RA would put on like the fake, the fake um nails. I think I remember. I I remember you trying it. Yeah. Uh, you would put some nails on and and see if that worked. But but I I would have no nails. Like I wanted to really feel the ball on the on the tips of my fingertips. Yeah, on my fingertips, I should say, um, and and so every before every outing, I would cut my cut my nails to to throw the ball. Okay, so with that, I was right, brand new Orioles twenty thirteen. I was throwing a bunch, right? Let's get ready. On my nails, it cracked about a quarter inch. On my yeah, I remember that. <laughs> what am I gonna do, Coach? Oh, hey, let me. Can I go on a DL? Give me a couple weeks. So I mean that was, but you know what? I overcame and adapt, and I I was fine. I mean, yeah, terrible timing, but uh, yeah, I'll never forget that. And I was just, but anyway, that's another story. Yeah, but yeah, that was it's... terrible. <laughs> yeah, you gotta, you had to keep your nails strong. Yeah, yeah, you had to keep them tight. Yeah, and uh, you know, I guess nothing, not, you know, super glue could probably help out a little bit. I don't know, but yeah, but I never. I think I would get little chips. Yeah. But nothing too crazy where, you know, because I would cut my nails before the outing. Gotcha. So um, you know, but again, it still it didn't help out so much the anxiety going into these games, right? Mm-hmm. So when I got to the big leagues, I wasn't able to really enjoy it. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that makes any sense. Because I was so stressed out about like Oh God, you know, and they were going to bring me in as a relief pitcher, a long relief pitcher. So, the you know the Rays in 2016, I mean, they had some great arms, and everybody stayed healthy. Yeah, you know, Blake Snell was with me in AAA, and he got his opportunity to go up and down uh, that year. But but he was mainly in in AAA, you know, and Blake Snell being Blake Snell. So, uh, just to show like the team, the pitching staff that they had at the big league level was just you know they're amazing. So. When I did get my chance to go up, um, it was as a long relief guy. And every day it was like, oh, God, you know, because it's like you're going to come in and it's you got to you got to come in and go. It's not a, you know, oh, OK, let me feel my way into this game like a starting pitcher. Right. It's no, you got to go in and, and go strike one right off the bat with the knuckleball. Yeah. So my first pitch in the big leagues was a pitch to the backstop. <laughs> yeah. That was my first pitch. It was a knuckleball, and I threw it to the backstop. Oh man! And yeah. so, um, you know, again, it was one of those things where so fortunate that I had the opportunity to get to that level. Uh, but the stress and the oh, am I ready? Am I not ready? Every game being a relief pitcher because you got to be ready every day. Yeah. I, oh, dude, it was not a fun not experience. Easy. Oh, just no, have fun no, because up there when you oh, throw it. oh, yeah. By the way, you're on national TV, but yeah, yeah we go ahead and just just throw it, right? It's like, dude, you know. <laughs> um, and so, but again, I ended up being fifty fifty in the big leagues. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was only up for a couple of what thirty five, forty days, mm-hmm. uh, and so my first nine innings, I was you know fifty fifty, sixty forty, seventy thirty, whatever. I was still mixing in my other stuff. And so I was feeling good, and um, we're in Chicago, and uh, Cash calls me in, and he's like, hey, you know, the front office called. They want you to throw the knuckleball more. And I was like, what? Like, but I got nine <laughs> innings. Like, I've only given up one run. Yeah. You know, like, I'm feeling good. I'm doing, you know. He's like, well, 
we're not we're not in a playoff run right now. If we're in a play, if we're making a playoff push or something, he's like, you wouldn't be in here, right? Like you're doing your job, you're getting out, you're coming in, getting out, you're eating up innings. We wouldn't be having this conversation, but we're not really playing for anything now. And you're here because they want to see you. They want to see how it plays your knuckleball. Yeah. And I remember from then on, it was, Oh dude, dude, it sucks. It yeah. sucks. So my next outing was against the white Sox, and, um, uh, in, at Chicago. And I ended up being a prayer pitcher, which is not recommended, right? Where you go out there and you throw it and you're saying, please swing at it please throw a strike like no that's that's not the kind of picture you want to be but for my last two three four outings whatever it was in the big leagues it was all strictly knuckleballs and i didn't enjoy it one bit so um but yeah i mean i was able i think i got i went three innings that that game gave up my first home run of the year to frazier i think it was what's it was joe frazier um i think we lost that game by that one run mm-hmm. and then my other one was against the rangers and you know again multiple innings but the all knuckleballs pretty much so putting me on national tv on a pitch that i don't know where the heck it's going everybody's watching right because you're gonna get yeah. all these text messages and everything that hey we saw you on tv you know you don't want to be a part of that non-top 10 right so yeah um and then you got your coach telling you hey you can't throw your other stuff oh so that was something that I didn't really enjoy, but obviously it's you're in the big leagues. I mean, it's it's an experience of a lifetime. It's um it was a blessing, mm-hmm. and I tried to make the best of it as best as I could. Mm-hmm. But when I was with Tampa in the minor league, you know, I go back to being a 50-50, 60-40 kind of pitcher. Yeah. Not so much your traditional, you know, knuckleball pitcher who's gonna throw it 85% of the time or higher. Yeah. So yeah, it was it was crazy. I mean, yeah, I got to live it up and you know, this and that, but it wasn't easy. It was not easy at all. So um all the throwing against the wall, all the, you know, I remember you drove out one year um from your house to Sarasota and, and yep. we got together for a weekend and just threw it, you know, right next to alligators out there in Sarasota. Yeah. Yeah, that was fun, man. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, I mean, no, we had some some great experiences with it, but um, you know, it's it's one of those things where you really got to go in and feel good about it for you to get to that next level. And so, anybody can do it. It's just you got to work hard for it. You got to stay dedicated, and you just got to just chase that click. I think once you once you get that click, you feel that yeah. you know. I, I always talk about it's an equation for me. Um, I've always been good at math, mm-hmm. hate science. Yeah. So for me, it was always like. Okay, let me dumb it down and put this equation together of like, you know, okay, my knee to my chest plus my glove goes out and the extension equals something around the zone. Um, you know, again, for me, I had to really dumb it down to 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 make it play for 80 to 100 pitches a game. So, um, but yeah, you're you're going to chase that click. You're going to chase that, that it feeling of oh, mm-hmm. there it is and then just run with it. You know, yeah. I think that's, that's the message you and I can send off to these young kids who who would want to throw a knuckleball, who would, who would like to be a knuckleball pitcher. Um, but I I always said, you know, because I remember uh, Buck Showalter told me, like, there's no knuckleball pitcher that's – or there's no pitcher that just throws them. Like, you're either a knuckleballer or you're not. And so – and I respect that tremendously, you know, Buck Showalter, the, the years that he's been around baseball. Yeah. But in my head, I always remember thinking, like, there's going to be somebody soon that will throw 95 plus with a knuckleball. Um, and I think we almost saw it with the guy who's with the Padres right now. Um, I'm not sure how many outings he's had, but he did throw a couple knuckleballs with 93, 94 mile an hour fastball. And I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, uh, um, Matt Waldron. Is there name. you go, Matt Waldron. Yeah. yeah, and unfortunately, he gave up two home runs on fastballs. Yeah. It was on fast, you know, and it's like, ah. But, you know, I think in the future we will have something like that because that split finger is looking more and more like a knuckleball. 
Mm. Um, you know, not as much rotation, mm -hmm. um, especially if you really have that that fork ball. I've seen mm -hmm. some fork balls really look like knuckleballs, mm -hmm. um, and and some guys. And so, so we're we're getting closer and closer to that feeling of having guys, you know, ninety five plus with the knuckleball. Mm -hmm. So um, hopefully, we get to see that in in our lifetime. But it's yeah. not easy. No, but it's definitely doable. Yeah, yeah, man. So. I mean, you know, you, you touched on it a little bit there. Just best advice for, like you said, someone starting out with a pitch. It sounds mm -hmm. to me repetition. Find that, that that click, whatever clicks. Find the click. Find the equation. Find yeah. whatever helps you dumb it down. Yeah. Simplify it. Simplify it. Nothing too crazy. I yeah. think that was what what R A D K R A Dickey was really pushing towards. Of just like. Well, I'm just I'm just splitting my eyes. I'm just getting, you know, and it's like you're on national TV, you just yeah. want to say young, you know, and that's all you're thinking of just splitting your eyes or just really coming down through it. Um I mean it's 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 crazy, but yeah, that's that's the way baseball is at those levels. It's something it's simplified, you know, mm -hmm. there's no magic wand mm -hmm. um for you to get at these levels of these guys where they just work extremely hard at it and they're they they know what they need to work on, you mm -hmm. know. We could be out there all day throwing sidearm with the knuckleball, mm -hmm. and it's probably not going to get us any better because if we're throwing sidearm, we're coming across our body, and if we're coming across our body, that means we're going to miss side to side. So, not beneficial at all when it comes to, you know, going out there and, and trying to miss up down with these things. So, so really having quality practices with the knuckleball and focus on that, and just just stay stay determined you know yeah that's it gotcha yeah yeah that's good advice it's yeah being determined i think uh persistence is is key because uh yeah it's a feel thing and um there's a lot of guys that have better knuckleballs than you and i on the sidelines but when you get on the mound it's a little different and uh you need to be persistent on the mound i feel like you know yeah yeah absolutely you got to get on the mound um oh yeah a ton of guys can throw a knuckleball right oh, but yeah. you you get them on the mound you get a runner on first base you know you got a three two count it's like okay you throw a knuckleball throw it in this count yeah like, yeah it's not easy to do it's not yeah. easy to do uh easier said than done yep is it fun yeah of course it's fun but when you have how do i say this we're very competitive right i've always oh, been yeah. competitive by nature so I never want to lose uh, in anything that I do. That's why I don't play video games because I'm not good <laughs> at them. Therefore, I'll lose. But, yeah. you know, we we do anything else that I'm kind of decent at. Like, I'm going to do my best to kick your butt. So, every every batter that I faced was always a battle. And it's like, okay, who's going to win this? You or me? You or me? Mm -hmm. And so, and again, that's where I had a hard time of saying, oh, three, two count. I got to throw a knuckleball. It's like, but wait, I want to blow this thing by him or I want to, yeah. like, you know, I want to do this or that. You got to throw the knuckleball. I had to throw the knuckleball and I had to learn how to just stay calm with it and just make a pitch as opposed to tense up, muscle up, blow it by them. Like, no, you just got to follow your little equation and get, you know, up, down through it and just, you know, be around the zone. But it was so hard for us to be that guy, especially being so competitive how we are. Right. So, yeah. Um, you're going to, it's going to be stressful, but I think the things that we were able to learn from that, if you could start that with that foundation and yeah. move up, like, you know, I think that's kind of why we're having this conversation in the first place is to try to make it easier for the next generation. So when they do start throwing it, they don't do all the dumb things that you yeah. and I were doing and, yeah. you know, me throwing it like a curveball and, and you dropping down or, you yeah, know, it's just a lot of that stuff, but. Uh, Phil Necro told us to drop down. You remember that he wanted to throw it from our hip. Yeah, it's tough. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's tough coming from a guy like him, right? You know, he's the he's a godfather or whatever. Yeah. Um. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When we went down to Sarasota, I mean, it, I remember we talked about it, and I agree. Like, yes, this is you got more more room in the strike zone, right? You got more room mm -hmm. here. Harder to hit this for me. Like I wasn't like, oh, let me drop down. Like, like I remember we, I gave it a while. 
I was like, all right, Eddie, I'm gonna try to throw on top, right? Let's I'm gonna go yeah. on top, straight down. And I it was just like it was like me trying to throw a lefty. You know what I mean? Like like it just wasn't <laughs> it wasn't clicking. And you know, you're not the first person to tell me that. It's like, dude, you know, try to get here, try like let me back up. I was still I was still getting through the ball, but I was right, I was coming across. Yeah, we'd come we'd across good yeah. ones. I was just killing spin, but like you oh, said, oh yeah, we can throw great ones. Absolutely, it's, it's hard. Yeah, it's, it's 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 harder. I think you can do it, but your margin for error is smaller versus if you're naturally coming more over the top, you have more room for error to get this movement versus yeah. a guy that's coming more side to side. Right, and you also have to remember. I mean, when when Phil was pitching, um, maybe a little bit even with Wakefield, like yeah. the strike zone was bigger. It yeah. was a bigger strike zone. Yeah. Um. So you could be six inches off and get the call for a strike. You could. Yeah. You could. You know, have it high. You could have it low. Yeah. Um. But what Ari Dickey, what Stephen Wright, I guess what I kind of went through for a couple of days. You know, uh, it's harder. It's harder. Mm-hmm. Strike zone smaller. You got to get these guys on swing mode. Um. And so your room for air is not you have to be up down with it or else you're going to run into some trouble going across your body you, you yeah. know going across your body is going to create a consistency and consistency is going to be you walks. know ball four walks yeah hit batters yep so um if you if you are going to learn it you know try to stay in what they say now stay in the doorway you know mm-hmm. just keep it simple and and almost like an iron mic just go forward with it. Chin chest goes to your target and see what happens, you know? Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I, when I got to the big leagues, my, my experience was more of a, of a prayer pitcher, you yeah. know, uh, my equation wasn't really there. Yeah. Um, it could have been there, but I think getting me on that stage, it's like, am I ready for this? Am I not ready for this? It's like, Oh God. So um all that thing that we just talked about with oh runner on first or hey runner on third don't bounce it oh god don't you know yeah and so all that will get to you it's not just oh i got a good knuckleball uh, it doesn't matter it doesn't matter when you're on the mound and you know the winning runs on third base and you're trying to get that guy out but, yeah uh practice is key practice practice won't make perfect but it'll it'll get you better it'll be persistent right no yeah. they say no yeah, practice, yeah, makes permanent. Um, yeah, that's one thing I, I try to do. I've said I didn't I never figured it out, but uh keeping count, you know what I mean? I didn't want the game to be the first time I kept you know what I mean? Like you go to a bullpen, oh man, you know, well, look at that thing, you know, oh that's great, but like keep yourself accountable. Hey, uh catch, let's call pitches, you know, let's call balls and strikes, you know, let's keep it real and uh you know what I mean? It's easy to throw when there's nothing, there's no value to your pitch versus keeping account. Hey, you just threw four balls, like make an adjustment versus if right. I didn't keep an account, it could have been like, wow, did you see that movement? Like, that's great, dude. But we need strikes. Number one, uh, I think, you know, try to simulate, yeah. you can't simulate exactly right, but that's a way to make your practice more like the game. Keep counts. Yeah. Change your looks with runners. Like, you should not, and this is something I had big growing pains with is uh, during bullpens, I would change, come set one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, you know, change my looks in the bullpen, you know, mm-hmm. run on a second. I think that's key, right? Because like yeah. you said, there's a lot of position players that can kill spin all day, but you want to practice. Like you said, hey, there's a run on third, you know, in your head or, you know what I mean? So, oh yeah, no, I think, I think the hardest the hardest thing for me as a knuckleball pitcher mm-hmm. uh, was pitching with the runner on first. Mm-hmm. I had a hard time with that because we had to give the catcher some time, you know, where if the guy did run, it wasn't on you. You know, you're, so yeah. I think, I think being a knuckleball pitcher one, four was probably my cutoff. Mm-hmm. Um, ideally you want to be one, three or faster, but with the knuckleball, I think a one, four, if I could be below one, four, I, I feel like, okay, I did my part in that. Um, but the the thing that that I couldn't put my head, like I just couldn't put two and two together is at one point I had a better arm with my fastball than R.A. Dickey 
Mm -hmm. but he could throw the knuckleball harder than me, Mm -hmm. you know? And so that's something where I was like, wait a minute. Like, so is it my grip? Is it, what am I doing wrong? Or, you know? um, And so, and that's something I still don't understand. I think he just really got a click. He got a feel for it and it clicked and he was able to just do it over and over and over again. And that was something that at the first, at first you and I were chasing that feeling. Um, But I, it's like, okay, when he throws his fastball, as hard as you can, and I do it, mine's three, four, five miles are harder. But when he throws his knuckleball and then I throw it, his knuckleball is three, four miles an hour harder. You know, so it's like mm-hmm. I couldn't really understand that. Um, but he just he found that feel and, and he could throw it, right? And so I think that's the feeling of like with kids when they're starting to throw change-ups, you know, they're slow and then, you know, then they get to a comfortable – point where they could really throw it and finish mm-hmm. it and so um i think that's where that comes from with that when it came to ari dickey and even stephen wright for that matter too stephen wright you know he was he would throw it in that mid upper 80 uh, mid upper 70s uh with the knuckleball um and he was very deceptive throwing his fastball too yeah they were they were aggressive with it they weren't up there yeah. just like you know throwing darts they were aggressive with it they they almost they almost competed with it versus you know, if you look at Wakefield, I don't know what he would say. I mean, you know, it looks like he's playing a game of catch. Like, he's almost – that's just my opinion. Yeah. I don't know what his thought was. Like, he's just, hey, I'm just playing catch with my catcher. Like, just – Yeah, just yeah, that's pretty much what it was. I think he was, like, 55 to 65 with his knuckleball, yeah. Um, you know. But but it was cool with his career because he was a, he was a hitter, right? He was a first yeah. baseman with the Pirates. He was a regular – you know, he was an athlete out there. So yeah. he went from that to being a pitcher. And so I think that was his analysis of just, all right, let me just play catch with them, right? Yep. Um, and then Ari Dickey was a regular pitcher. He was, you know, I think he was a supplemental round pick guy and kind of lost his fastball and, mm-hmm. you know, knuckleball kind of brought him back. Same with yeah. Stephen Wright. Yep. Stephen Wright did same kind of thing with Ari. Um, but, but, yeah, playing catch with it and really throwing it you know, I think I've always liked that. Hey, let's let's throw this thing. Let's yep. let's be competitive with it. Um, let's get some weak contact out there. Yeah, you know, and that's if with if you want to be a knuckleballer, that's something that you understand that it's easier and it's better to throw two two knuckleballs and boom, the ball's in play, than um, sit there and three two everybody and then okay, let's just say you struck out the side. Yeah. But yeah, but it, it took you 30 pitches, yeah. you know. So it's something that as a pitcher, as a starting pitcher, is you got to eat up innings, you know. that's That was a big goal for a knuckleball pitcher is to eat up innings. And you're setting up your pitchers for the next day, right? right? Because that team just got done, you know, they, they, they went through three at-bats and they saw a bunch of knuckleballs, yeah. you know. And so they're kind of losing a little bit for the games to come when, okay, now you bring in that lefty or you bring in that hard throwing righty, um, you know, they just got done seeing the knuckleballer for yeah. six, seven innings yesterday. So um, again, there's, there's a lot of theories that go into why a knuckleballer is so beneficial um, with the Rays. They used it as, you, you know, we had, I think we had like, uh, who was it? We had a lot of pitchers, but let's just say it was a hard throwing righty, followed by me knuckleball for two innings, and then bringing in a lefty. I mean, so the Rays had an idea behind it, and obviously Tropicana Field, like the ball just moves a ton more at tro- at the trop with the really? with the Rays organization, yeah, because it's a dome, and you know a lot of these like you know with the track mans and everything, like the records I would imagine are at Tropicana Field because of how much the ball moves there. It's crazy. I don't know what, you know, again, there's more to it than what we would know, but being indoor or in a, in the dome yeah, could be beneficial. Right. Yeah. You know, which goes back to when Ari Dickey was with the Mets. I want to say he was with the Mets did well. And then when he went to Toronto, he maybe he struggled a little bit because he was in the dome but it might have not moved as much. Who knows, right? Yeah. But I know that when you're elevated like Colorado, yeah, the ball's not going to move as much. 
Yeah. Um, and so there are those things that happen, right? But um, but again, I mean, it's it's just a matter of a team taking the chance on on a knuckleball pitcher who's going to go out there and you know, not so much you got to win all the games, but you just got to be able to eat up innings and be competitive and keep the the game tight. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I think it's good value, right? It, you, like you went through it all, just a different look. And um, generally, it's less stress. I don't know. Generally, I'm not saying you still, I mean, for me, I, my arm would still get sore, but it wasn't like when I was throwing conventional, like I'm going to throw this sucker as hard as I can. Right. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. It's, it's a less, it's, you know, if you're one through 10, one being your slowest, 10 being your hardest, you're a conventional pitcher. Every fastball you throw is a 10. Yeah. Now, when you're throwing knuckleballs, okay, well, you're – again, we just talked about how it's yeah. – uh, knuckleball is three different pitches. You're slow, yep. slower, slowest. Yep. So, you're not going to get as tired out there um, when you're just kind of playing catch. It's like you're – it's like you're, um, your coach throwing batting practice to you guys, yeah. right? Yeah. He's throwing 200 pitches yep. in the day to you guys throwing BP to everybody, you know, yeah. you got all these different groups and your coach is just, all right, bam, bam. So that's the thought process behind a knuckleball pitcher. Who's not, you're not at it at a hundred percent. You're out there, you're, you know, throwing your 70 mile an hour knuckleball and, and you could last longer and it's yep. not as stressful on your elbow if thrown correctly. So yeah, yeah. that's yeah. a great point that you bring. Yeah. Yeah, man. Well, Eddie, man, I, I, those are all my questions. Um, is there anything else you wanted to share with, you know, you know, that uh, you don't think we covered that, you know, you want advice or something that you wish maybe you knew when you, when you started best piece of advice. That I wish that I knew. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. It's not easy. I no, no. I think, I think you just got to go out there and just start with strike one, you know, yep. start with strike one. Um, pitch to contact. Don't be afraid of contact. Pitch to contact. Yep. And as long as you're in the zone with the knuckleball, I mean, you're going to have a great career. Yep. You know, who knows how high you'll get, but if you could throw a knuckleball and be around the zone and have, you know, out of 80 of them, 40 of them really good ones, and the other ones, you know, iffy, doesn't matter because, again, the hitter doesn't know when you're going to throw that crappy one. Yep. So, have confidence. Uh, go out there with 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 that confidence that hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna get out of this no matter what. Even after you walk the first guy or or you walk two guys back to back, um, you're the guy that could get out of that and strike out the side after that. You know, and that's that's the thing about the coach. If he if you are a knuckleball pitcher on a team, your coach has you for that reason. So. They always talk about your coach always being like a rocker. Like, okay, do I go get him? Do I sit yeah. back? Like, oh, I'm going to go get him. No. I'm yeah. Because you could have those highs and lows with the knuckleball. You know, you can, yep. you know, back-to-back walks and then, oh, he's ground ball double play. Okay, he's out of it. Okay. Next inning. I mean, you're going to have those wild pitches and it's a part of it. So I think what what you and I always remember with Till Negro was he told us like, hey, you throw that wild pitch where that's 10 feet away from the strike zone. You act like you expect you meant to throw it there, you know. You keep that mentality, and you go back and and next pitch. All right, it, it's that's all that matters is that next pitch. Don't you know? You don't want that energy of like, oh god, like I don't, oh god, I don't know where my knuckleball's going. I'm lost. Like no, you gotta have that. You gotta get off the vibe of like, okay, I'm you know I'm literally the king of the hill, yeah, and I'm gonna bring it to you guys. And oh yeah, that ball went twenty feet over, but. I meant to throw it up there, even though obviously you had no idea where it was going. Right. But, um, you know, you got to keep that mentality and, and just, just have fun, have fun yep. with it, you know, and hopefully, you know, the, the young generation that's to come or the guys that are, you know, thinking about throwing an uncle ball, like we're here, we're here. You can send us messages. You can send me a message on my Instagram, Eddie Gamboa or Eddie underscore Gamboa. Um, and, yeah, ask away, you know, because yeah. we have all this experience of um, trial and error, and and I know I know Stephen Wright is like that too. He's he's an open book, um, but 
yeah, just just ask away, and and we're we're excited to see the the generation to come when it comes to the knuckleball, keep it alive. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's not a lot of us. Um, yeah, that's the goal, man. I'm excited, dude. It's just, um, yeah, especially with social media, it's so easy to get in touch with people now, right? You just just send yeah, a message away. So, all right, cool, yeah, man. Absolutely. Well, Eddie, dude, I appreciate your time. It's been a lot of fun. Um, you know, maybe uh thinking about maybe doing some maybe tech tips or whatever in the future, you know, yeah. two, three minute videos of you know, you on the field, maybe, hey, this is what I mean when I talk about this, or you know, something short, sweet that helped you in your career. Yeah, um, you got it. You know, yeah. you got it. You let me know. And thank you again for having me, Zach. Yeah. I appreciate it. And um, uh, you know, hopefully uh you you keep going with this podcast and, and yeah. get, you know the the more knuckleballers to come yeah for i'd sure. love to hear their stories <laughs> yeah yeah it's a lot of fun all right Eddie. all right man i'll talk to you, you later got it. you bye. too bud thanks see ya